Uh, but why am I asking about about financing and, and raising capital is because I want I wanted to set our discussion to talk a little bit about the M and A activity in the space because if if financing is or was rather easy, that must mean that companies have enough access to capital to buy projects. But we are not seeing a lot of that yet. So, um, well, I guess maybe I can make this even a multiple question, a multiple choice question. Um, maybe is it is it that a there there are no good projects to be acquired, or like AKA big companies are not looking to buy anything right now. That that kind of surprised me, but maybe is it that b there is there is will to buy projects, but there is not enough money that can be raised for M and A consistently or like not not in not in large quantities is it that maybe c exploration companies are just not willing to sell their projects uh, at the current valuations because they think that the uranium price is going higher and are kind of being not greedy but maybe they, they're anticipating higher price so why not wait they're being patient let's call it patient or is it none of the above or is it all of the above what, what, do, you, what do you think is hindering the m&e cycle well, I love the um, multiple choice approach here. Can I put an F, which is a little bit of everything and some of nothing? So the what I mean by that is, so taking a few of the, the elements of your alternative answers there. So first of all, M&A tends to be driven by script-based transactions, so share-for-share share acquisitions. And a feature of our uranium sector is we've only got two really big companies in this sector. And then we've got a couple of mid-tier and then a whole host of juniors. And the juniors range between more substantial juniors down to micro caps. And that's different to most other metals. In most other metals, you've got like distinct tiers of alternative equity exposure to the commodity or to the, the mining, for example. Um, and so what that means is there's only limited numbers of sources of cash for M&A. You know, you've got the big players. You've got a couple of others who can raise cash to acquire assets if they absolutely have to. And I think the acquisition of Uranium One's assets in America is an example. You know, the cash consideration was a requirement of that deal. A Russian company didn't really want to be left with Canadian or US shares <clears throat> um, until that is we saw in the last big boom in 2006 2007 and that's when the end users enter the fray via uh, vertical integrations and that's when they pay big dollars for more mature assets for the assets that are development ready and where we saw just about all of those was africa so, for example, Uriman was bought out the Trekopu mine in Namibia for $2 billion US. Extract Resources, which had the HUSAB project in Namibia, which is 20 k's down the road from us, that was bought out for $2.4 billion or $2.2 billion US. And then you had Mantra, which had the, uh, had the Makuju River project in Tanzania bought for over a billion dollars as well. Now, why were all of those cash acquisitions concentrated in Africa? Because that's where utilities want to play when they absolutely have to secure control of resources. So it was Rosatom buying Makuju River, it was Arriva buying Uriman, and it was uh, the Chinese group CGN buying Husab. Hmm. So the question then becomes, what happens in M&A in this sector between now and when we see that level of maturity where the big players start to understand that they have to throw proper dollars at securing the feedstock. And that sounds like a lot of money, you know, rolling billions of dollars off the tongue. But, for example, its production is enough to support CGN's nuclear build, which is over time going to be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's all relative to the big dollars that get spent, um, I suppose, constructing and also running nuclear power reactors. Mm. So a couple of other aspects of what you were saying there with your multiple choice question. It, the other thing is you've got to remember that apart from being a fairly small sector, 
that doesn't have all of those tiers of companies that you would have in a more developed sector like gold or nickel or um, iron ore, for example. We've also had a long time in the wilderness where, in relative speaking terms, there's been very little investment, very little investment in new exploration, very little investment moving assets forward to a development-ready stage, and that's reduced the field of new opportunities. So when we look across the board at uh, potential M&A targets, for example, um, there's a fair bit of assets that have been around for a long time that haven't really changed. Um, and to a certain extent, you'd put a tango in that category. A tango has been around for a long time. However, it did change because we changed it from a very large 20 million tonne project that was going to produce 7.2 million pounds with a large capex bill to a Tango 8 where the capex was absolutely slashed and we're now producing a three and a half or we plan to produce three and a half million pounds with the potential to upscale once we're in production. Um, so there aren't that many new kids on the block that you can start choosing from. And a lot of the assets out there have got in one way or another uh, a rough edge that you need to get your head around as an acquirer. Again, that'll change. We're starting to see more exploration companies get funded. We're starting to see more new concepts. And over time, we'll see some more discoveries and we'll see new ore bodies come. And, you know, it's, it's part of our strategy to be keeping a really good eye on that so that we can potentially partner with some of the more attractive, more interesting um, new discoveries that are made as this as this um, uranium cycle starts to mature a bit more. Hmm. I think this tells a story. So why I'm asking these two things, financing and M&A, is because I think it tells a story about sentiment. If financing is really easy, and if there's a lot of M&A happening, um, and if even projects that are not as good get picked up for a lot of money, then you know that the sentiment is really hot. And you know that the, 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 the sentiment that really matters, which is the smart money, the big money in the industry, they're not always that smart. Some you know, big companies always make mistakes, also make mistakes, sometimes buying bad projects at the top of a bull market um, for billions of dollars, as you said. So, But it tells you about sentiment, and it's showing me that maybe sentiment isn't completely there yet like and and, and that's actually bullish because it means that there's a lot of room to uh, a lot of room left to run like is that the case do you think that's the case oh most definitely yeah mm. most definitely mm. you know the, the players that will be making the very large investments in the nuclear fuel cycle including the uranium mining part of that they're only just getting started we've only just seen macron reverse some very destructive French policy. And that's going to take a little bit of time to mature, to bed down. It's going to take time to reorient the attitudes of uh, the politicians and the executives within EDF and, and Urano to understand what they've got ahead of them in terms of uh, building out the new ambition in France and elsewhere in terms of export markets. You've got the same with the three major utilities in China. Um, it's still fairly new, the 14th uh, five-year energy plan. Uh, it's still fairly new, the government confirmation that they will be building 10 reactors per year for the next 15 years. Then you look at India. So India's just announced uh, a confirmation of site selection for their next mm -hmm. uh, phase of reactor builds. Um, you look at Poland. So they, in a very short time frame, have now gone well down the path of approximately seven nuclear reactors, seven to nine nuclear reactors. Uh, you can say the same about Czech Republic, about Hungary, about the UK, for example. You're seeing a reversal in Belgium. You're seeing a reversal of closures in the US, plus SMRs, which are going to become their own demand centre. Now, yeah. on the one hand, that, of course, presents a fabulous array of demand growth for the industry, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited. But also in terms of understanding how this market matures, those, all of those organisations, their first focus is on delivery of those largely political goals that have been set for them. Hmm. And once they've given a certain level of attention to the delivery of those 
goals, things like um, site selection, things like um, uh, environmental approvals, large-scale contractors, technology selection in many cases, as, as in who's going to build the reactors for them, and a you know, really myriad of other considerations, then they think, well, where are we going to get the fuel? And that's when you see this maturity. And what's really interesting is when you've looked at the progress that's been made in this sector, say, since COP26, there's been something of a wall of good news. And across multiple continents, there are, um, there are simultaneously delivered goals that are being put in front of these various um, energy companies and utilities and government departments. And so what that means is more or less, they will be coming simultaneously to the realisation that they're going to need to secure their uranium at the same time as they're looking over the shoulder at all of the other competitors. And that has, uh, I think, the ingredients for um, some time from now, the ingredients for a highly competitive situation when it comes to both contracting and trying to secure uranium via legal contracts, but also trying to secure uranium ownership at an asset level. And so that is why I think we've still got a long way to go in this sector. And I'm, I feel like we're um, at a really exciting moment in terms of investors who've either been in the sector or investors who are looking to um, consider if this is the right sector for them. Brandon, this has been, um, I have a lot more questions to go through. So we're probably gonna have to schedule another interview because I know you have to go in like two minutes, literally. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd say um, thank you for your time here. And is there something that you wanted to add at the end? Oh, just how, how much excitement there is in the sector. Like I'm seeing that already up in London. Uh, we, we've had a lockdown border in Western Australia. So this is my first chance to travel. And it is a dramatically different picture to what it was two and a half years ago, the last time I was in London. Really? Um, investors eyes are totally open on this sector. So that's one of the reasons why I really feel confident about the thematic of generalist investors coming in. There's mm -hmm. lots of um, fund managers who I've been talking to for years here in London who've been happy to follow. They remember what 2007 was like. They've wanted to stay in contact with the story, stay abreast of the industry, but they haven't taken action. And now I'm seeing those fund managers start to work out how they're going to start laying their bets and how they're going to get exposure to the sector. So I'm feeling very optimistic and I think we're in for a really good ride.